Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Virtually Reality's Spring Summer 2021 series, subtitled The Long Triumph. Over 10 weeks and nearly 30 separate events, The Long Triumph addresses the knowing sprawl Hello. of a world that has everyone been machinically back. shaped and how we might rethink our worldly engagements during and after times of emergency. Uh, we are currently working our way through our penultimate fortnightly theme, which is entitled Dystopian Thinking is No Longer Helpful, uh, where we're giving voice to speculative futures, hauntings and utopias. You can stay up to date with all of our plans by joining our mailing list, the link for which uh, was already in the YouTube chat next to this video, but unfortunately due to that technical hitch that we've just had, we, you've just found us at this new uh, Zoom link which was posted in that chat. So uh, that will be coming imminently. Um, yes, so tonight I'm really excited to present Transcultural Music Technologies. Uh, this is an event that will shine a light on two recent browser-based tools for music making developed by Khayyam Alami with the creative studio Counterpoint. Our discussion today will be led by Khayyam Alami, an Iraqi-British multi-instrumentalist musician, composer, researcher, and founder of Nawa Recordings. He holds a BA and Masters in Ethnomusicology from SOAS at University of London, and is currently completing a PhD in composition at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, part of Birmingham University. Birmingham City University, sorry. Uh, Khayyam will present for around 15 to 20 minutes in a second, after which he'll be joined by two special guests in discussion. These are firstly, Sarah Bader, AKA Fractal. She is a British Egyptian interdisciplinary artist and classically trained multi-instrumentalist, working with live sampling and improvisation, vocal manipulation, field recordings, and generative rhythms to compose intensely emotive and immersive explorations of sound. Secondly, we have Sam Salem, a British slash Jordanian composer who creates works for performers, electronics and video. He is a founding member and co-artistic director of the Strathfold Ensemble and is currently PRISM lecturer in composition at the Royal, North Royal Northern College of Music. He was once described by the New York Times as young. Uh, so I am now very happy to hand over to Khayyam to begin his presentation. Hey, Michael. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the um, stimulating uh, themes that you're covering in the festival this year. Um, where, where do I start? Uh, I've done this quite a few times now, so sometimes I tend to miss out um, key information. So if um, you have any comments or any questions, please do just um, post them in the chat and um, we'll uh, deal, deal with them as soon as we can. Um, I'm going to talk just very briefly about the the ideas behind uh, these two tools that I co-developed with Counterpoint. Um, they were released in January as part of CTM Festival, um, alongside uh, you know manifold different uh, representations. But um, ultimately, these two tools um, that run in the web browser. Uh, are based on the fundamental concept of tuning. And um, Wendy Carlos, in one of her articles in the late 80s, she wrote an article for Computer Music. She, she mentions in it that, for her at least, there, there are, she refers to this thing called the three T's of music, being timbre and tuning and timing. And for me, the subject of tuning has always been incredibly fascinating because I'm a, an oud player. I, I play the oud and I've been studying uh, Arabic maqam, Middle Eastern music, um, some Indian music for uh, over 15 years now. And um, the, the tuning systems in those traditions are incredibly evocative and um, uh, I find them incredibly meaningful. But as I tried to... Uh, develop my practice and to start thinking about compositional ideas that didn't rely on traditional instruments or traditional m ways of um, melodic development, etc. I really struggled to use the digital tools that we have at our disposal and 
as time went on, I found it more and more frustrating because I felt somehow limited uh, in terms of my creative expression. And after many years of struggling with all the workarounds that um, are available for uh, microtonality and for tuning in all the digital tools, I, I, I was really um, uh, dissatisfied, not only with the capabilities, but more with the way that these ideas were being represented. And ultimately, what I realized was that there's a, a certain supremacy that comes with Western music theory, which is embedded within all of the digital tools that we use today. Um, and so I decided to try and create a couple of uh, alternatives. Many people have taken this or assumed this project to be about trying to allow the performance of traditional music on the digital tools that we have at our disposal today, synthesizers, DAWs, this kind of thing. But the truth is that it, this whole project couldn't be further away from that. Ultimately, what I realized during my research was that if I had an idea in mind and I wanted to execute it, for example, I wanted to use a specific tuning system and I wanted to create a composition based on that tuning system, then I could find workarounds and tools to somehow get to that. But if I didn't have any ideas, if I just had a mood in mind, or if I had a sound that I liked, or just a simple melody, or even nothing at all, I just wanted to sit down and explore and see what might happen, there was nothing that would facilitate that kind of creative exploration. And ultimately, this is why I ended up calling repressed possibilities, because I think that Although the technology has allowed these kinds of um, functions in the tools that we have today, the, the possibilities for the exploration of those ideas and for um, a real sense of uh, uh, creative freedom weren't, weren't really there. And so um, as part of my uh, PhD, I'm essentially creating a repertoire of uh, contemporary and experimental uh, Arabic music compositions. Um, this is a very vague, uh, uh, like, overarching idea, but that's kind of intentional because trying to define what Arabic might be is in itself problematic. And I wanted to have the space to be able to think about different kinds of compositional ideas and techniques and instrumentations, etc. But as part of that um, research, I developed these couple of tools, um, which I'll share with you very briefly um, before we uh, crack on with the with the rest of the discussion. And these tools are twofold. One is called Lima, and Lima is um, was created for the exploration and the creation of tuning systems. And the other one is uh, Apotome, and Apotome is a generative music system that's based on these uh, different tunings. And I decided to stay away from the terminology of microtonality and focus on the word tuning and transcultural tools, specifically because I feel that one of the major problems is to do with the constant centering of Western music or Western references, um, no matter what other musical culture we're talking about. And an essential part of this project was to try and treat all musical cultures as equal. And that, that goes for the conceptual ideas that are embedded within it, but also the actual um, interface design and the, 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 the way that the back end is working. Um, certain elements are obviously lacking but i think more than more than not this balance has been and and this like equality has um has been reasonably well represented um i'll quickly share my screen and um show you how what these tools look like and very briefly how they work there are tutorials and a user guide already published online so please feel free to um have a look at those. So this is Lima. When on the first page you have two choices, you can either select a tuning system from this ever-growing database that uh, I'm slowly inputting, um, uh, you know, different tuning systems and data into, or you can um, create a new tuning system from scratch. And it's better 
it's best to kind of show you how it works by uh, by going through the creation of a tuning system. So here we have our reference pitch. We're all used to seeing A4 equals full 40 represented as tuning in many of the digital tools that we have today. But the reality is that we should be able to use any uh, note name to represent any frequency. For example, in the Arabic music system, generally the fundamental reference pitch that the tuning system is based on is what would be referenced as a G today. And um, so uh, rather than... Sorry, I always forget it does that. Rather than having to use A440 and figure out what the relative change of the A within the tuning system should be here, you can choose any note to be whatever pitch. So even if you didn't want to stick to the G3 uh, as is represented in equal temperament, you can adjust it and find um, a, a, a different uh, frequency from which everything else will be generated. Um, the next page is a very simple bar, and this is where one would um, type in or uh, create the divisions of the octave. So that can be done by using um, typing in uh, ratio values. So this is a perfect fourth, or uh, typing in sense values. Uh, let's do something. Uh, Sorry, we'll do something here. Um, or you can break the rules and just... ...slice with the mouse. Once the tuning system has been created, we get to the last page, which is a representation of that tuning system as a, as a wheel to indicate that it's cyclic across, across all the octaves. And here you can very quickly map uh, we started on G so I'll do that on G uh, and so very quickly you can have access to the tuning that you made um, and hear it and play it even polyphonically and now I'm just using a QWERTY keyboard so th the beauty of this is that we don't need any other tools we don't need any other uh, plugins anything to install you just go to the browser and do everything that you want in there and then this URL can be shared um, if uh, if I was to put that in the chat you'd be able to open and and access exactly what I'm doing here and the other um, important um, thing for visualizing this information that we have is different solmization systems and solmization is used in many parts of the world to represent different um, pitch classes by by syllables and um, so it's uh, for me really really valuable sometimes to be able to visualize this information in this way because it makes more sense to me based on the music tradition that I'm more comfortable with um, and then, yeah, aside from that, we can also have a look at the database. And one also a very important thing here is that very often, because of the Western perspective on tuning and microtonality, tuning systems are represented as scales. But in, the major in the many other musical cultures, uh, tuning systems aren't scales, they're systems and the scales or the modes are created from subsets of those systems. So here, for example, in this Farabi system from the 10th century, I've programmed into the database uh, many of these different maqams. And so if we look at this in terms of ratios, you can see that the 1-1, one, one, the reference pitch that we had is mapped to a G, but actually this mode, this maqam starts from the C. Um, from the 4-3 ratio and cycles round. So um, again, it's it's really about how this data can be visualized and represented in a way that's meaningful, depending on the musical culture that one is uh, dealing with. Um, the other more experimental things one can do is take this um, these interval distances and just shift them around. So you can keep the, the distance of, of the intervals in terms of the, the steps of the tuning system, but you can explore other strange permutations of those um, uh, um, subsets and the way that they're generated. Um, and the other thing which is relevant 
to uh, Apotome is that each of these uh, mappings has a role assigned to it, so whether it's primary or secondary, and that's purely visual here um, to try to represent which modes, uh, sorry, which pitch classes are um, uh, used in specific modes or subsets, but um, in Apotome this becomes a little bit more um, uh, meaningful in terms of how it can be used to generate music. Uh, very quickly on to Apotome. Apotome is a generative music uh, environment and it's based on tracks and these small modules. Nothing in it will work until you've chosen what uh, tuning system and subset you'd like to work with. So um, that always has to be uh, a choice at the very beginning that you can then uh, adjust afterwards. Um, here we have these role weights which uh, correspond to the way that the mappings and the roles were created in uh, in Lima and then a bunch of different um, uh, buttons and probabilistic sliders that essentially each time you manipulate one of them you're creating a new algorithm that will allow the um, the system to create generate music based on it um, we have these uh, uh, octave weights for, for which octave you want the sound to be generated in. Um, uh, the use of accents works when you create uh, 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 additive time signatures. So you can do three plus two plus five plus three and that will then generate accents based on those divisions. Um, you can choose the beat groupings of the uh, uh, generative uh, melody that's being created that's in terms of rhythm and it has also uh, a Euclidean beat uh, division generator, uh, randomized note delay articulations etc and then a basic synthesizer that's built in plus we have these web audio modules that are ports of classic OBX and um, the DX7. Um, so within the system itself things can feel and sound a little bit dated and a little bit 80s but all of both Lima and Apotome output uh, MIDI and uh, more importantly they output MIDI uh, both to um, virtual buses or hardware devices and both uh, in MPE and in monophonic um, MIDI. So this is uh, really useful for integrating this into your uh, workflow. You can have multiple tracks and you can also explore uh, forcing polyphony which means that within the same octave the same note will not be triggered on any of the tracks that have these um, this uh, switch on. So essentially it's just a way for um, exploring uh, music making outside of the conditioning that comes with tradition outside of the muscle memory that we develop as musicians it's uh, i'm not a big fan of generative music on its own but what i am a fan of is the possibilities that generative music allows us to hear and then you know gives us the opportunity to to fill our minds with um with melodies and and um, melodic concepts and uh, different kinds of rhythmic interactions that maybe we wouldn't have thought of, and so I find it very inspiring to just sit and play and listen and 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 use this as a kind of palate cleanser, um, and and then take ideas from there and develop them in in different ways. Uh, that's not to say that it can't be used, but that's just um, my preference. So. Uh, yeah, that's essentially how they how they work. And uh, like I mentioned, and like Michael mentioned, these both run in a web browser. They are completely free. Um, tutorials and user guide are available for everybody. Everything's being slowly um, but surely, uh, you know, modified and and refined. So please, if you have any um, uh, questions or ideas, my email address is uh, on the homepage. Um, and uh, feel free to get in touch and let us know what. Yeah, what you like and what you don't like and um, we'll see what else we can do to make it all uh, a little bit more interesting <laughs> so um, I'll stop that there and um, and maybe Michael we can uh, move on to the uh, discussion uh, unless I miss something that you'd like me to touch upon um I don't think so uh, I think that's great I think it's good to leave um, as we said privately before to leave a bit of time now for the for the discussion um, and maybe if anyone has any questions or we can come back to things at the end uh, and yeah fill in any gaps if anyone spots any <laughs> um, but yeah thanks very much for that brief introduction to Apotome and Lema um, and joining us now 
uh, will be Sam Salem and Sarah Bada, aka Fractal, to continue this discussion. Uh, please, if you have any, converse, uh, any conversations, any questions uh, for Kayam, Sam, or Sarah, please feel free to post them in the chat and I can relay them to our uh, panel discusses, discuss, discusses uh, imminently. So Sam and Sarah and Kayam, I'll now uh, disappear again and pass over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, lovely. Hello. Um, nice to see you again. Uh, yeah, I'm not really um, uh, sure where to kick things off from. Um, I, I would love to hear your impressions um, about these tools and and if they, I don't know, uh, inspired any ideas or if they, you know, uh, generated any thoughts that that might be interesting to discuss between us. Sure. Um... I can I can go with a couple of reactions to your presentation if I am. Um, first of all, I, I really I really love these tools. I think they're really uh, important, but also like incredibly useful in lots of different scenarios, uh, some of which you outlined yourself. For for me, um, maybe it would maybe my comment would make some more sense in the context of my own work because I don't come from a like music theory background I come from an electronic music background so I'm sound based um, like notation comes at the end for me I, I don't think in notation really um, so some of the things that you're talking about uh, ratios uh, both in pitch and time are, are really interesting and well executed in your application but I guess when I work I work with frequencies directly because I work in a kind of spectral way where I take field recordings and I extract pitches from that. It can be like kicking a glass and I'll take the pitches and someone's going to sing this pitch and someone's going to play this one. So it ends up being microtonal, but not within a, a tuning system as such. Um, but the reason I, I bring that up is that you mentioned Wendy Carlos and one of the workarounds that I have two workarounds to achieve my strange dreams. Well, one is to work in analog, in the analog domain, um, and one is to program. And I work in both of those domains. The analog domain, I have my instruments, I can tune them how I want, I can kind of generate ideas. In the digital domain, I make my own tools, but they're kind of jerry-rigged, janky things that, <laughs> that kind of I iterate for years and they kind of do this or that. Um, so that's been my workaround and approach. But the thing that I don't like about that is that the analog route is it's very elitist. It's very elitist. It's not accessible. And I feel that very strongly when I'm, when I'm using my, I love my tools. I love these as instruments and I love playing with them, but it's hard to recommend it to a student or someone kind of starting out. Hey, why don't you, why don't you try just intonation? You just need like, a, you know, 10,000 10, euros <laughs> and, uh, and a table and you'll be fine. Um, so I think, I think what you've done with, with these tools is great for that purpose, actually, for, for actually trying these things without that uh, barrier to, to entry. Um, and I also wonder, like, um, one of the things I really liked about Lima is the, is the quotations, like the citations for where the uh, the scales come from, and that's something I've not seen in in any of the other software that I've that I've used over the years. And I wondered, could you say something about that? And, and is that an important consideration? And if so, why? Because I, I think that's really, really kind of a key thing that's that's that you're doing with this. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, my my main gripe with uh, with the Scala scale. Um, the, the repository um, is that the majority of the um, uh, files that are in it have some citations, some sources, but sorry, not the majority, a, a, a reasonable amount do, but many of them don't. And b over time, the Scala Scale Archive has developed a, a kind of s authority about it. And what has happened is that instrument manufacturers and plugin designers and everybody, they all rely on that archive. 
um, the Scala Scale Archive Survey, it was called, in order to give musicians access to some element of whatever is, is available in terms of tuning data. And unfortunately, the way that the Scala file system itself works, as elegant as it is, it does miss out a lot of contextual information. And the sources and, and adequate representation of those tuning systems or subsets is are really, really key. And what I wanted to do here was I didn't want to create a database or a repository that would um, just reperpetuate the same problem. I wanted to create something that ultimately could open be opened up to um, like community submissions, peer review, something where you could rely on it not because it has this sense of authority about it, but because you can see exactly what information is taken from where and therefore um, compare it, uh, uh, disregard it, critique it, whatever. But the, inf the information is there and it's, it's honest. And that's a, that was really, really key for me. So a, a, along with the contextual information for what is the root of this particular subset, um, or, and what are the primary and secondary degrees, uh, etc. Ascending, descending, we'll get, we'll get to at some point as well. But where do these things come from? And who actually wrote them down? Um, how do they exist? You know, th these, these considerations are really, really important. Because one thing I noticed very often is that people will be excited. Oh, wow, the Scala Scale Archive, there's over 5,000 tuning systems. Let's download those and try something out. And then they'll, you know, load it up and in a whatever synthesizer that would accept that file format and they'll play something on the keyboard and it'll just be like, oh, this just sounds funky and exotic and I don't really understand it. And yeah, and they'll just move on to something else. And and I think that, um, that, that, uh, What's the word? The, the, there's a, a really sharp schism there between meaning and um, uh, like a meaningful interaction and and just pure tokenism and exoticism. Um, and, and that's why all of these considerations have been paid to these little details, because ultimately they help us try to have a more meaningful interaction with this information. No, I think that's uh, it's an extremely important point. Um, I mean, in terms of how I think how important the work that you're doing is uh, going back to my own musical background. I grew up very much in the Western classical music context uh, with uh, Suzuki for guitar and later got more into jazz, played piano. Um, and then electronic music production came much later um, and already, you know, there's the, the music of my childhood that I've very much internalized and you can kind of at least with string instruments a bit if you want to, you know, these, these sounds that kind of um, are stirring, for lack of a better word. Um, they tend to play well on certain instruments that allow for that. Um, but then you come and you start to work with, you know, something like Ableton and um, you record and you hit melody to MIDI and then things start to fall apart because, I mean, before MPE and just, it's, it's a bit where the, technology was saying there's a hard limit on how your analog music will translate into digital. Um, but this point about exactly exotic music um, and also the information that you are now opening the door to uh, for many more people um, is exactly that it's, it's this big box that's labeled exotic with everything treated the same way, completely devoid of context. And in order to start to unpack this and to show that, first of all, I mean, music precedes Western classical traditions. Um, I mean, so much comes from folk vocal traditions and, and the voice is the most, in many ways expressive instrument. And there is no hard limitation on that, just our imaginations and our 
cultures and all of that. And to have that start to translate into digital space and to become um, a tool as much as it is a canvas of its own, I think is really important. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really inspiring to see that this is finally, finally um, uh, coming to light and, and that people can try it regardless of where they are. That's, that's another thing. The accessibility is a huge thing. So, yeah. Yeah. One thing I found that was a really big problem was that, um, when I started this path of trying to create these tools, I actually started with um, working on a Max for Live device and very quickly realized that actually just putting a device out there that can do this thing is probably not good enough, and specifically because the contextual information is all missing somehow. And, and there's there's it's there's obviously an entry barrier, but there's also something missing and there's too much centering around equal temperament and deviation from equal temperament and these kinds of things and and so i started thinking a lot about what kind of contextual information needs to be uh, out there and aside from the like political and the cultural stuff that and i've talked about quite a lot in 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 other um uh, events over the last few months I think the, the 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 point of education is really really important here because just having something that can do something is not quite enough specifically when it comes to a subject like this that has been so veiled for so so long and and something so fundamental like you said Sarah it's like the you know the the, the fluidity of of music of the human voice of pitch across cultures across ages is something that we really, really have lost, you know, in 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 the last what, 20, 30 years, specifically because, n not because of the technology, but because of the way the technology is implemented. So, in order to get that, to to make some of these ideas at least a little bit more um, uh, uh, accessible. I realized that this can't just go out there as a thing that can do a thing. It needs to go out there as a thing that can do a thing with the reasons as to why, but also try to think ahead for teaching, for research, for composition, for um, any kind of integration and, um, and allow people to find their own ways as much as feeling the need to actually sit down with the teacher or take a class or read a book or whatever to, to, to find, to, to understand something because the exploration and the fun can also really be ripped out if you end up having to do something with a with a teacher or um, have somebody guide you through it. And then you feel like, you know, you've tried to leave one dogma and ended up in another one, right? But having some space where you can understand things a little bit more in, instinctively, maybe, um, I, I thought would be would be interesting to actually try and, and represent some. Um, I don't know if you... If uh, Sarah, you ever tried to work with um, any different uh, tuning systems, or I don't know, maybe you were, had an idea from a song that you heard once and tried tried to get it to work and it didn't work, and you know, I, I would really love to hear you know about the some of your processes and some of the struggles maybe, and and if you know there's more that's missing that that can be done in order to try and resolve some of those issues. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, up until now, it's been using the, the pitch bend a lot. Like that's that's basically the the only way. Um, and then I guess now with uh, uh, what is it, Live Eleven, and I mean things are starting to open up. Um, but it's actually one of the reasons that I mean, I of course I rely on MIDI a lot because I cannot own every single instrument that I would like, you know, and, um, but you lose a lot of the expression. Um, of course, something like that, like a seaboard keyboard, or, you know, there, there are some controllers out there that are uh, better, but again, accessibility is an issue. Um, so, but the, increasingly I found myself uh, recording my voice more and more in order to be able to get closer to the sound that I don't know I th I don't know if it's partly nostalgia or something but there there is this 
um, because also when it comes to Makam and um, it, a, a lot of it is not learnt, it's internalized. My music theory ends uh, as far as basically exactly classical Western music, but, you know, um, listening to Abdul Deir or Nasir Shama and, you know, just growing up also with a lot of it, it was more uh, of course, and, you know, this uh, basically the music that my parents listened to. So this, whether or not I choose it, it kind of has impacted how it is that I go about making music or improvising and then recording. Um, so being able to handle that inside uh, a DAW and um, kind of realize the full potential of the sounds that not only the sounds that you record, whether it be MIDI or uh, live recording, but also then arranging it and supplementing it with the instruments that you are not in the possession of. Um, yeah, it's uh, so I think that this definitely, um, and the point that you made also about um, Apatom, you know, being this, uh, almost this way to start to listen to music in a different way uh, or real, um, get a sense of what might be possible, I think is really important, like in terms of ideas. And um, so, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to using that more. Um, and, and that can feed into then improvising. Um, What about you, Sam? I mean, as... um, yeah, it's it's a really good, it's a really good question. What what has frustrated me about DAWs? <laughs> you know, um, Bitwig um, a few versions ago they introduced this kind of microtonal plugin, and it was like, great, we can do micro. It's going to be brilliant. Nothing will ever be the same again. But <laughs> it, it, like with so many of these things, it constrains you to. Uh, 12 notes in the octave right so it's kind of it gives you some way of tweaking things and then like uh, Sarah said it's almost like you can just pitch bend around equal temperament and that's you should be happy that you can do that right <laughs> so I guess because of my um, my experiences over the years I, I just I don't even use I haven't used MIDI for a long time for compositionally because I it's just that I yes it's not really fit yeah, it hasn't been in the past, at least. I, I don't know. I haven't got Live 11 yet, so maybe maybe there's some hope. But I've ended up just um, really being audio-based, which takes so much more time. Everything's like a production, <laughs> you know? You can't just kind of plug something in and try it quickly. Like, you have to, you know, I'm layering my individual harmonics like I'm Stockhausen and it's night, you know, like it's crazy. It's, it's so kind of uh, time consuming. And truthfully, I guess I like, I like to spend the time. So it doesn't bother me so much, but yeah, the tools are limited and maybe I just kind of accepted that they were um, prematurely, you know? And I think what's, what's nice about both of your, um, both of your tools is that they are not in Ableton because I feel like if you had these same things as a Max for Live uh, device, and even if we ignore the part about the missing context, which is super important, but if we ignore that and say it's not a problem, then you, you bring it into Live and you're still stuck with that 12 note piano roll, 12 note per octave piano roll. And then it, it kind of destroys the all of the symmetries of what you're doing and looking at. And, and whenever I try to do things, with more notes per octave in piano roll in the past, I, I, you kind of sit there with a piece of graph paper, like trying to remember what every <laughs> every key is, and you just give up almost immediately. It's not it's not worth it. So I actually think, yeah, it's it's great that it doesn't feed directly into that environment. Like I know that it can, but it's great that it is self-contained, and I really like this idea of um, the generative stream. You know because I come from like field recording, I always think of everything like field recording, you know? And I, f I feel the same about generative music. It's like you're sitting on a, 
a side of a hill and things are happening and you're recording and then maybe just this little bit is something that you never heard before and you'll take that and that, that'll become the basis of something else so i think having a, having tools to allow that to allow you to just sit and observe this stream of 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 information of aleatoric kind of information this kind of wander through the pitch relationships is really important because otherwise how are you going to have those moments of discovery right like it it can't happen yeah absolutely I, I think you touched on a really important point there that i i hadn't really considered much um it's because i'm not used to thinking about it which is labor like, really the the amount of time it takes to try and um achieve something that you don't know whether it's going to actually be any good or not but just to try an idea out for me in the past was always incredibly incredibly frustrating and i think that's one thing that really put me off using the tools and you know f pushed me to just focus on learning how to play oud and and just to have this instrument that i could pick up and just do this thing at any time right? rather than have to sit and program and fight with uh, updates and whatever um, but even now, like, uh, yeah, I just did finished a, a piece uh, in collaboration with Nakul Krishnamurti, who's a, um, a singer from Chennai, living in Glasgow at the moment. And we decided to work on this piece based on the North Indian, South Indian rugs and the 22 Shruti system. And it was so easy to just sit together on a Zoom call and pull up the, the the tuning system and figure out which rugs we wanted to use, what are all the ratios, where do we want to start each one. We did all these weird modulations and, you know, generating the, the ideas for the composition that we're going to explore together was so beautiful and so fast. It was just like, it was really, really uh, surprising for both of us. And then we had all this information that we could keep referencing back to. Nakul went away and recorded all of these phrases in these different rugs and just sent me, you know, like folders of, of files, which then went into Ableton to start working on arrangements. But so even in this scenario where I'm not really relying on the piano roll or on anything, the visual representation of the musical information itself so so now we're like I, I was out of the the pitch confines of equal temperament we're working you know arrhythmically with these kind of alap style raga phrases but just because of the grids in the visual interface and the grid of the um, of the timeline i kept finding myself getting pulled back somewhere else and and so this is the another part of the labor which is fighting against that like you know you, it feels like a magnet that's just trying to pull you to to its very clean and simple lines all the time and that's not um that's not to say that i dislike ableton live or, or these kinds of tools i really do love them and and in, and this is why i want to be able to use them but but i want to use them on my own terms not on terms that are imposed upon me and and it, and that friction just takes so much time and so much energy that ultimately Unless you're really determined to execute an idea, <clears throat> you, you, like you said, you just can go, oh, well, you know, I, I might as well just get my oud and give Nakul a call and put him on speakerphone and <laughs> just get him to sing and I can play and just forget all about this other stuff. I think that's, I just wanted to add, yeah, that you're describing in great clarity the story of my life here. Like, <laughs> you know, but I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really important to remember that as well. Like the kind of uh, constraint um, vertically of the pitches is matched by the constraint horizontally, right? And I also don't work on the grid, so I have I have just like problems all over the place. And but yeah, what what a what a way to um, think of a solution though. And I, I like this kind of no no barriers solution. You know, I think this is is something that's really exciting actually yeah it's not quite there i think i mean there are there are limitations right but but i but uh, as sarah mentioned earlier i think this this at least for me what's been really inspiring is just having something at my disposal that that can mm, just influence me in a different way let's say rather than you know 
fighting with arpeggiators to try and get something that is meaningful or or fighting with tuning on different devices and then changing a preset and then the tuning resetting back to equal temperament and every time you change a preset you have to go back in and you know all of that time wasted and actually it's not even really about the time it's it's much more about the energy um and all these hurdles that that that, that get into the way of the creative processes uh, you know is is what's been like the, the most frustrating and f at least having a way to to be able to access the, the the fundamental elements easier gives you the drive then to be able to actually invest that energy in rendering the idea properly afterwards but when that when those hurdles come so early on in the game i think um that it it really highlights this uh, point about software design and kind of how I often think about how the tools that we use shape the work that we make. And given that, I mean, in, in the digital space, there's this lack of immediacy in many ways in terms of having the thought or having the emotion and then whether it, you know, whichever tactile means there is to then translate that into something on screen, there is this exactly time and energy, both that kind of pass. Um, and not to say that having constraints is a bad thing. I mean, often having constraints yields interesting results. Um, but when everyone is using the same tools with the same constraints and there are many other things also feeding into kind of what it is that in inspires us what it is that we're exposed to on a daily basis it's kind of there is this um I wouldn't say convergence into sameness. I think that, you know, the music space is so vast and there's just so much work out there that um, it's, it's impossible to say that. But at the same time, um, there must be ideas out there that perhaps aren't being fully realized because of the tools that are being used. So it's, it's kind of, just as a, a thought exercise, kind of, I mean, it's it's a lot to to start to overcome that. And even I think from an arrangement point of view, um, this can a bit start to, because software has its own culture. Um, and the fact that there is this piano roll or the fact that there is this grid, or, I mean, I remember just the fact that Ableton had two views was considered like, you know, revolutionary um, to, to address diff potentially different contexts that a musician might find themselves in. That was like a big deal. But then what if, what if that goes even further and that basically you can configure your tools to be whatever you want them to be without having to also put in a lot of labor into building your own software, which of course people do. And, but not everyone again has that, um, has the time or the ability. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of. Um, yeah, it's, it's ultimately about fundamental principles. I think, you know, when, yeah. what you mentioned there about being able to to, to you know use the tools and have them represent things in the way that you'd like to use them we can do that visually for example you can go in and change your colors and whatever and make it feel more individual but actually you know seeing as the the, the technology can handle these different kinds of of grids i'm not against grids i'm just against the idea of not having a choice other than either one grid or nothing you know and, and so the ability for I was thinking the other day when working on this piece with with Nakul, the ability to be able to r render the 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 rhythmic grid as, as according to a particular groove that my, I, I might have selected would just be magic because then at least just seeing that that the the, the visual representation of the groove 
And and even something like you know you have these um, alternating colors but, uh, of old ways of like four bars or groups of four bars on the timeline, being able to change that to five or three or nine or seven or anything else other than four would make such a huge difference because I, I literally just last week I was working on this piece and finishing off and I was struggling all the time to fight against putting everything in groups of four because that's the way that the information was being displayed. So it's not so much like you mentioned about saying these tools are no good and we, but it's more about introducing this element of choice as a fundamental principle within it you know people complain about the piano roll i don't think the piano roll is an issue but remove the piano roll and just have pitch lines that show us which pitches we're using depending on the tuning system that's being chosen even if they're still limited to octave repeating no problem but but then this is where different kinds of energy starts to be created and and you're right 100 percent that that software has its own culture but there's so it, at the moment we're just seeing it all like this like you know um that that would be really fascinating hi michael sorry i feel like we're about to open a bottle of wine and just uh... <laughs> yeah, it's fine it's lovely it's lovely to hear um hear all your thoughts uh yeah what what you were just saying about the piano roll i mean the piano roll, I guess, is something which is kind of emblematic of like the um, institutional kind of lineage of how music is meant to be taught to people, right? Like through this Western piano idea, which itself is something, especially like for composers or whatever, is 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 you know the instrument you're meant to play to get into writing music, and it's also the instrument that you think about, you know, the the famous composers of yesteryear, like like playing and um, and so, yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask a, a, a question about like, um, it's quite a broad one, but like, what what would you like to see change within kind of higher education, contemporary music teaching um, to kind of facilitate these things, these kind of ways of thinking that, that, that you're thinking about to kind of shine a bit brighter and, and have a kind of backing an institution or more of an institutional backing than currently they have? I think, like, really just tuning as a concept, you know? Like, it's it's really, really fascinating how, the, the, you know, m musicians, students can go through uh, university systems right up through to master's level and never, never, ever have a single idea that this thing exists. I mean, it's it's tragic, like, to say the least, you know, just to know that different things exist, right? Not not use them, not be forced to internalize them, but just to know that they exist. Uh, when doing my research, for example, I, I, uh, I, had, I ended up going right back to like the earliest tuning systems that, that we have on record right? and trying to understand how these were created in the early days. And there are two beautiful, incredibly elegant systems. One's the Babylonian system from about 1800 BC. And one is, well, maybe a bit later, 2000, 2500 BC. And one is the uh, Chinese system, f supposedly from around 1700 BC, but, but written down in about 300 BC. So incredibly elegant, so incredibly simple, right? And so, so incredibly beautiful. And why, why we, we don't know about these is beyond me. I'll give you a quick example. The Chinese system says you get a piece of bamboo, you... you block the bottom, and, and that becomes your reference pitch. Then your uh, next set of pipes, you either remove a third or you, you add a third to the length of the pipe. That's it, a third. And by doing that, you end up going through the circle of fifths, and if you do five of them, you have a pentatonic scale. And if you keep going up to 12, you have a chromatic scale, which will never hit the octave bang on, right? Because this is the problem of the, of the comma, whatever. But it's so elegant. It's so simple. That's how you make a musical instrument that you blow into, right? The, the Mesopotamians had a harp and they have a system where you start with this string and you, you tune this string to the to X other string and you make sure that the interval between them is, is pure or clear. That's the way they describe it in these tablets. Um, cuneiform tablets. Once you've done those two strings, you check X string to another string, you check X string to another string. And once you've gone round through the whole cycle, you end up having cycled through seven different modes and tuned your instrument 
and then ended up back where you started. It's absolutely phenomenally elegant and beautiful. Why that today nobody knows about those things and that they exist and that they can spawn all these other different ideas and why that ability is not so accessible with all of these technology that we have today is just beyond me is so elegant and so simple right um so i think for me that would be that would be ultimately the first thing because it's it's much easier we have a lot more information if you want to get into grooves and rhythm which i think is really really valuable as well but that the, unfortunately the research for that just doesn't exist um so that would be that would be another major one do um any of do i have sam or sarah do you have any thoughts on that as well sure i, I mean yeah what the question was uh how can higher education be improved right to raise awareness i think i think it's and this is a little bit what sarah and uh, Chaim were saying um in re regards to ableton it's about like which parts of the system are assumed as being things that can't change or aren't examined and which which parts of the system are uh explained as being a part of the system that could also have another function or be represented in a different way so i think it's about just making sure that we examine pitch as a fundamental property that exists rather than an ether that everything else happens in you know like that's the, the, just this assumption about what it is in the same way maybe we deal with with other aspects of music already but I think that things are improving. There is a growing awareness there. And I think it's also, yeah, it's about really kind of exploring fundamentals as fundamentals, getting into that and, and doing away with assumptions. And maybe part of that is who, <laughs> how to put it, maybe part of that is is representation and who whose interests are being represented represented in institutions right so you know i think i think that's also an important part of the equation um maybe for us these things aren't assumed so we're comfortable to examine them and pick them apart but maybe for others they are just an assumed thing so that's why it's important to have diverse vo voices and views and interests within any institution right Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that um, academically speaking, or when it comes to music education, um, there's a lot that's given as a default um, in many places. Um, there isn't kind of, I mean, what from this people could strive towards is to have everything on level ground because really, I mean, it's a bit like saying which direction is the earth oriented towards. It's just, you know, a, a lot is arbitrary. Someone at some point said so, and it's stuck. Um, and of course, not to get into the power or political dimension of it. Um, I think that moving forward and also to get away from this, um, first of all, to be interested in, in music beyond uh, what is conventional in many places, for it to be like couched in terms of, only in terms of like ethnomusicology or something. Um, I think that it's kind of, things need to move beyond that. Um, and uh, representation is a huge part of it. Um, and context as well uh, and history to 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 learn more i didn't know about this thing about research and rhythm and groove i like that there's some dearth in research that's that's interesting and i wonder also why why is that the case um yeah i think that if at least you know that something like lima and Apotome to uh, spark interest in, you know, especially a lot of young people who are, are starting out and, and exploring music and to also see that 
things aren't classified like that this is world music and then this is music music like it's just it's it's such a weird dichotomy and it's a false one as well and I think that um, anything in academic context and beyond that that can help uh, kind of um, show that that's not that's really not how things are and haven't been either before the I guess the last decades um, no it's there's a lot of potential there so um. One thing I like about this database that you've made is uh, when I was playing with it, my my mind was going to um, how else could you represent this information other than by region? Like, could you also have a chronological list of of tunings? Like, that would be super interesting. I'd I'd be really I'd be there all day, just kind of nerdily <laughs> going through them. You know, I've just had this conversation a few days ago with Hassan Hajairi, actually, but. Um, the idea is to, to w once all that data is slowly ingested, then you can visualize that data and represent it in so many different ways. So I'm thinking about different ways of categorizing and, and making that information available based on these same principles of choice, right? So if you want to see things chronologically, you can based on whatever data is in there. If you want to see things regionally, you can. If you want to see things based on intervals, you can, you know, I think that would make things very, very exciting. But um, And it's it's crazy that it's only the Scala scale archive that exists with, with all of this content in it, but, but that not being reliable ultimately because it misses so much. So it does take a lot of of time actually to 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 put everything in but once you know we'll get there in a couple of years time and then things will be will be even more uh, 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 you know um, what's the word uh, varied but but it really th that's the beauty of of being able to put stuff in a database and have have it accessible and, you know especially if we end up being able to to render an api for example then anybody else can take that data and visualize it and do whatever else they want with it in any other way and i think this is the really interesting thing about web3 as well and where things are going with in terms of what the browser can do and what what you can do with just that as a as a platform rather than having to to deal with software that you download and you have to pay for and you have to update and and these kinds of things so Yeah, totally. Um, well, thank you very much uh, to all three of you for, for joining us this evening to have this discussion. I think it's been really, really lovely to hear your uh, individual perspectives on things and, and to try and find some kind of common ground uh, and that's the kind of quite disparate artistic practices that everyone has. So I'm um, yeah, really grateful for, for all of your, uh, uh, yeah, your willingness to be a part of this and to be part of this discussion. So thanks very much. Um, Yes, I think that brings us to the end uh, now. So um, thank you to everyone for watching this evening and um, please keep up to date with uh, what we have going on for the rest of the series. As I mentioned, we're partway through our dystopian thinking is no longer helpful uh, theme uh, at the moment. And we have one more to come after this. Uh, and there's a whole host of new commissions and uh, pieces that we've been recording and other live events to come very soon. You can check our website for that, which is www.virtuallyrealityevents.com, optional forward slash SS21. So thank you very much and look, looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>